I'm Marty Stauffer, and this is Yellowstone National Park, located in northwest Wyoming. The park's waters vary from near boiling to near freezing, and they support every manner of life, from algae to eagles, from bacteria to bears. This is Yellowstone Lake. With 110 miles of shoreline, it's the largest of its kind at such high altitude about 8,000 feet. Its deep water is clear and cold, even in summer. My diving crew and I are getting ready to explore this underwater wilderness, a world never seen by the park's two million annual visitors. We'll be looking into the life of a creature that is the cornerstone of this entire aquatic ecosystem, the cutthroat trout. It's as intriguing as it is lovely and its story is more amazing than I ever expected. Our exploration will begin at the southern end of the lake, in the thoroughfare country, the wildest wilderness left outside of Alaska. Join us as we search for the essence of this wild and beautiful place, the brilliant cutthroat. For eight months a year, Yellowstone is held in winter's icy embrace. The total number of visitors for the entire month of January is less than the number that come here during one day in July. Man's buildings and boat docks impose on less than 2% of Yellowstone's 2 million acres. This first lady of our national parks was established in 1872, her land and animals protected by government mandate. In her huge lake, there lives the world's largest inland population of cutthroat trout. And they're the reason that we're here. Along with me on the Boston Whaler we'll call home are my brother Marshall, who now lives in Dallas, but like me, grew up in Arkansas. And another Arkansan, who's also a lifelong friend, David Huey. One of our 47 national parks, Yellowstone is nestled in the mountains of northwestern Wyoming. Near its center lies Yellowstone Lake, and on the northern shore of the lake, our base, Bridge Bay Marina. We head out of the marina toward the southeast arm and the thoroughfare country beyond. 
The lake is not only large, it's ancient. Some 600,000 years ago, a volcanic explosion formed portions of the lake basin. Later volcanoes alternated with ice ages to sculpt the landscape that we love so much today. Man the hunter arrived on the scene some 5,000 years ago. Yeah, that looks like a good place. Yeah, I'll go show Marshall. Right here. Today's master hunter along the lake is the bald eagle. This rare predator now finds sanctuary here, one of the few remaining places it nests. Nesting populations, although never large, have remained stable over the past few years. Just to catch even a brief glimpse of a bald eagle, our national bird fills me with wonder and pride. I'm barely prepared for what's about to happen as Marshall, David, and I discover that we're not alone in our quest for the cutthroat trout. A valiant try, yet no trout this time. In other parts of the country, the eagle's diet may run as high as 95% fish. Here, it's only 25%, and of that, only half is cutthroat. It goes in for another try. The pair is occupied with family duties, providing for hungry young eaglets at the nest. We move on. We also want to film the other wildlife that feed on cutthroat and look more closely into the web of life that begins in these rich waters. A smaller cousin of the bald eagle comes here every summer from as far south as Costa Rica to feed its young on the wealth of trout, the osprey. Over 90% of its diet is cutthroat. It specializes in catching the smaller fish. The major predator of adult cutthroat and a most unlikely looking title holder is the white pelican. Because of its ability to catch the larger, mature trout, the pelican competes very little with the osprey, which eats mainly smaller, immature fish. The lake hosts a summer breeding colony of about 500 pelicans, the last one left in Wyoming. Eagle, osprey, pelican. That they can survive here is a living tribute to the management plan of the park and to the importance of the cutthroat trout.
As the pelicans return to their nests on the Mali Islands for the night, we find a campsite on shore in Wolf Bay. Man, this smoke follows me wherever I go. <laughs> you know why that is? Even if you're sitting at a campfire by yourself, you know why it seems like it follows you? Because it does. How's that? Your body creates heat, radiant heat, creates a spiral in front of you and sucks the smoke in. Ah! And even, no, even sure. if you move around the campfire, when the smoke seems like it follows yeah. you, it does. Yeah. I'm serious. Yeah, I, sure. No, I read that. I read that. Heck, I guess. Sure. Sure, Marty, sure, uh-huh. Yeah. That makes sense. It, it sort of does. Watch it, Dave. This is a wilderness right here. God, I love it. Beautiful. Grizzly bears. Right here. <laughs> right in our backyard. Well. I'd love to see one. I know it. Uh, you remember all those we saw in Alaska? God, that's great. You know, this is this is the wildest wilderness there is. This thoroughfare country right here. The southern end of Yellowstone Lake. You know how far it is to a road? How far? It's a two-day hike in any direction. I wish there were grizzlies here like that, but they just they're just hard to see in Yellowstone. Remember the first year we came up here we saw a bunch yeah, of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll probably see some this trip before it's over. What's your plan for filming those trout tomorrow? You gonna do any diving? Yeah, we might dive tomorrow. Oh, that'll be exciting. I know it. I'm looking uh, forward to that. It's gonna be great. The first thing we want to show is that this lake is backwards. Is that right? The big trout, there's only one kind of trout in this whole lake, cutthroat. That's it. I'll be. The big trout are in the shallow water medium trout, and in the deepest water, there's no trout at all, except for little ones. The little ones are down deep. That's where the little ones go to hide to get away from the big ones, so they don't get eaten. Do you know, David, in the warmer waters in the south, the fingerlings stay in the shallow water, you know, in the underbrush? Yeah. And the larger ones stay in deeper water on drop-offs, waiting for the smaller fingerlings to stray into the deeper water, then they eat them, prey okay. on them. Just backward to this lake, huh? Yeah, it's probably because there's just only one species or one fish in the lake. Yeah. That's what it is. It's yeah. a, the cutthroat trout has evolved to protect itself from itself. And what we want to do is we want to show those levels of the lake, and then we want to find the trout, find where they're congregating, and follow them up the spawning streams. Got a lot of work ahead of us. It'll be interesting, you know, because it... The spawning stream. The next morning we head farther south. We'll be diving at the limit of where motorized traffic is allowed. The no motor rule protects the pelicans and other wildlife from undue human disturbance. Everybody ready? Here we go. Our destination is Plover Point. Deep in the heart of wilderness, it's the perfect place to begin our search for cutthroat. Yellowstone Lake plunges down to 320 feet and averages about 130. Plover Point is surrounded by several miles of relatively shallow water, only about 40 feet. Adult trout are rarely found deeper than that, and all trout stay within the top 50 feet of the lake. A variety of wildlife lives around Plover Point, including common mergansers. Trout is also a major food item for these diving fish ducks.
This is clear. This is great. It's deceptively shallow. All right, let's get that diving equipment out. All right, let me see that dry suit. That's first. Okay, you guys get that raft in the water. I hope this water's not as cold as they say it is. Me too. Marshall takes off in the raft to set out the warning buoys while David prepares and checks the diving gear. The pressure change because of high altitude and the frigid temperature of the lake water require extra precautions. I get the dry suit ready. In June, the water is about 50 degrees at the surface but it gets colder fast, just a few feet down. Hypothermia is possible, even in summer. Thus, the dry suit, which retains body heat better than a wet suit. All right, zip me up. Warm, yes. Claustrophobic, well, maybe. I hope that feeling won't hit me underwater, but my snug dry suit and face mask and all the dangling gear are telling me otherwise. The diving buoys Marshall is setting out are another precaution. They'll warn passing power boats to steer clear. Other than the dry suit, the gear is pretty standard. A weight belt to sink me down and a buoyancy compensator to get me back up. Those, along with the tank, add up to more than 100 pounds. The mergansers must be amused. For them, diving comes naturally. Of course, the camera also requires protection, a waterproof aluminum housing. That's another 50 pounds. At last. I've dived in the Pacific, the Atlantic, and the Mediterranean. Still, I'd rather be right here in Yellowstone Lake with the cutthroat trout. This cold mountain lake is barren by sea level standards. It lacks any large crustaceans like crayfish, but it abounds in smaller members of that same family. Two types of freshwater shrimp are the most common bottom creatures. Keratin from the shells of insects and from these shrimp are responsible in part for turning trout flesh its characteristic red color. Just as trout is a succulent feast for humans, so are these shrimp for the trout.
Discounting man, the cutthroat is top predator in this food web. The shrimp, in turn, feed on microscopic organic matter. Low nutrient concentrations and cold temperatures limit the life forms in the lake. But a number of plants have also adapted to survive here. Obsidian sand, boulders, rubble, Fine clay and silt mixed with organic matter make up the bottom. I search for other signs of life and find a freshwater leech. This parasite attaches itself to the trout only for an occasional meal and so poses little threat. But leech and trout share one distinction. Both are native wildlife. Leaving the leech behind, I come upon a strange discovery. this lake with limited plant life, the balls, as we call them, are fascinating. Some are attached, some not. Some are hollow, others solid like grapes. We later found out that they are nostoc, a blue-green algae which grows only in pristine waters. Each ball is a complete colony of tiny single-celled organisms. On my way back to shore, I come across some long-nosed suckers. Native to Yellowstone River, they were accidentally introduced into the lake. It has not yet been determined whether their presence is harmful or helpful. Suckers may compete with the native cutthroat for the same food, but as bottom feeders, the suckers have filled an empty niche in the Yellowstone system. The smaller red side shiners were also introduced into the lake from other park waters. Though they have established a firm hold here, their influence on the trout is also not entirely understood. It is known that shiners and young trout eat many of the same things. And as I'm seeing, that adult trout eat shiners in shallow water.
these young trout, or fry, stay in deeper waters. They find food and safety here, far away from the reach of the hungry adult trout, which stay in shallower waters. Soon, many of the adult trout will leave. How they survive a perilous journey from the lake to their spawning areas is the next part of our story. We'll dive in the raging rapids of Yellowstone River as we continue the amazing story of the cutthroat. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, Enjoy our wild America.